Um, so again, my name is Andrew Sutton. I'm talking today, today about metaprogramming. So hopefully this goes well. I'm not used to presenting uh, online, so this is a, a bit of a different format for me. Okay, so this, this talk is really a, a snapshot of my current work on, on metaprogramming. Um, so it's based on a forthcoming kind of big picture paper for, for metaprogramming for C++ um, that will eventually turn into hopefully a number of proposals for C++23 and, uh, and beyond. Um, the, the goal is to kind of, with this, this work, to be kind of forward thinking rather than um, sort of reactive, like here's a proposal idea, what can we do with it, let's move it forward independently. I wanted to really include a, as, as big a, a wider range of pictures or ideas and features as possible to see if we can't find some kind of like coherent integrated design with the language for, for sort of comprehensive, um, comprehensive in C++. Um, I'm not really doing this independently. There are a number of people that have been, that have been helping and who I've been bouncing ideas off of. Um, specifically wanted to call them out. Wyatt Childers, who's an employee of Lock3, uh, David Van Devoort, who works for EDG, uh, Faisal, who is an independent uh, C++ expert, apparently. Uh, Barry Revsman from Jump, uh, Jump Trading has a bunch of proposals for, well, you name it. I think he, I think Barry was the one who um, finally ushered the spaceship operator into C++20, uh, we all know. All right, so this talk is uh, conveniently about metaprogramming. Uh, the, the title should have given that, that away, I hope. Uh, the talk is really divided into two parts. So I'm going to look at kind of current approaches to metaprogramming. Uh, I want to say briefly, but I'm sure that'll occupy a reasonable amount of time. Um, and then sort of what at least three different aspects of what we could expect or what we hope to provide looking forward for um, new metaprogramming features, which would be static reflection, uh, source code injection, and compile time file I.O. Uh, this is kind of an abridged overview of those features. Um, there are longer talks on this subject from CPPCon 2019. Uh, in particular, there's one talk on static reflection and one talk on uh, the source code injection that I gave earlier. They're longer, they have more details, <laughs> they have a different syntax, um, but the, the core concepts of, of those talks are the same, so the contents are reasonably, should translate reasonably well. Okay, so. Um, template metaprogramming actually has a long, well, metaprogramming in general has a long history in C++. So I think this goes back to like 1990, I wanna say 1994, uh, when a guy named, I wanna say Steve Irwin, but that's not correct, uh, Irwin Unruh, um, uh, discovered that you could, you could use the template system to print out prime numbers as, as error diagnostics, which was pretty interesting. So people kind of picked that up and ran with it and said, hey, look, we can use this the template system to start computing types and values at, at compile time, right? So we can effectively use the template system to act as a kind of microprogramming language within a language to, to build small functions or programs that, that compute these things. So here's a really, I want to say here's a really simple example, but if you haven't seen any, any template metaprogramming before, this might be a bit of a shock. Um, hopefully that isn't the case for, the, for this group. Maybe it is, uh, I don't know. But I'll uh, explain it a little bit. So this is a template metaprogram called choose. Like this is the, the, the primary name of the, the template here, the, of the meta function or meta program. Um, so choose takes three parameters. It takes a, a condition, a Boolean value B, and then it either returns, and I'm using the word return here quite loosely, uh, a type true or a type false. So if you pass in, if you, if you instantiate this with true or choose with the value true, you end up getting um, this version of the template. If you instantiate it with false, you end up getting this version of the template, right? And so you can kind of see within each, ver each different of the version, they declare a nested member called type, which is set to either true or false. This is, this is effectively a, a kind of named return value from a meta program. So we can say that the primary template, the top one here, is, uh, is returning the type true and the bottom one is returning the type false. And then of course, because we, we like C++11 uh, type aliases, we can make a, a simple uh, access or an alias to, to sort of pull that return type out, type out to make it easier to use. Right, so if we if we have this facility, we can use it to, to write some very simple code like this. So T1 is choose uh, between sign or unsigned with the condition true. 
And likewise, T2 is the same thing with the condition false. And you know, we, it gives us, basically it gives us what we expect. So the result of T1 is in fact signed. The result of T2 is also in fact signed. Um, but it might be worth pointing out that these things are also meta functions or meta programs that we, we typically call type traits. It's a, a question about a property of a type. They are evaluating or computing values based on, on these known properties. So in this case, uh, is signed as true, is unsigned of T2 is false. Fantastic. This is sort of template metaprogramming in a nutshell. Um, you can do fantastically complicated stuff with this, by the way. This is a very, very simple example. Right? So if we, if we think about it, um, it turns out we actually kind of have a, a limited Turing complete functional programming language. I say limited because there are limitations on how many templates you can instantiate. You don't get like infinite recursion with templates. You can get recursion with templates, but it's not infinite. Most compilers, I think, tend to limit to um, at a thousand, a thousand instantiations. Um, but it is Turing complete. Like it does offer recursion. It does offer the ability to branch. So you can you can write fairly complex programs in this language. In fact, arbitrarily complex programs in this language. Um, the language is kind of weird. It's not quite a normal normal syntax, right? Like templates are functions, or class templates are functions. Um, instantiation, uh, template instantiation is a function call. Nested declarations are, are kind of named return values. Um, conditions are, are template specializations, which give us a kind of form a sort of pattern matching over uh, over values and the shapes of types or the spelling of types. And we can use this to compute types and values, uh, and even template declarations. Although mostly we don't, we tend not to use it in the, the last case. Just because we have template template parameters doesn't mean we use them very frequently, right? So there are kind of three examples, three cases that I see template metaprogramming being used. Um, excuse me, drinking water. Um, computing compile time constants is a big case. I was one of the initial cases, right? If you're computing prime values, you're computing compile time constants. The idea is that you have some static data or, or configuration, and if you can offload the computation of that, that static data to, to compile time, then you don't have to pay the, the cost for it at runtime. So hypothetically, you get faster startup. Um, Type-based optimization turns out to be a, one of the biggest uses of it. Um, this is used, for example, heavily in the standard library to, to optimize um, standard algorithms. Basically, given a, a set of template arguments or however you instantiate a function template or an algorithm or data structure, the implementations tend to choose as fast of an algorithm as possible. For example, if you call standard copy with a pair of pointers as your input or output range, um, well, input and output range, the compiler will reduce that to mem copy, which is about as fast as you can get on any system. The last use case um, that I tend to see with template metaprogramming is, is generative frameworks. And I mean, what I really mean by that is frameworks that are used to, to compute or to construct data structures. So rather like in contrast, like a vector is not what I would consider a generative framework. That's, that's a generic data type. You put in a vector of, of ints and you get a vector of ints. Um, the boost graph library, the boost graph library's adjacency list, if, you've, if anybody's ever looked at it, is a, is a generative framework. You, you end up plugging in selectors, like I want to store my vertices in a vector and I want to store my edges in a set and I want to store adjacent vertices for or edges for every vertex in, in a linked list. You kind of plug in these little, these little values or these selectors and there's a whole bunch of metaprogramming in the back end that will synthesize a data structure corresponding to those selections. Right? So this is kind of like the, the sort of policy-based type design or class design that you, you might get from uh, like Andre Alexandrescu's uh, modern C++ design. Not strictly generic programming, but more having a more generative aspect to it. Okay. There are some downsides, of course, to template metaprogramming. Uh, if you've ever seen it, you, you probably know what one of them is. Um, it's got a weird notation. It can be hard to read. Uh, it can be hard to write. It almost certainly requires expert uh, knowledge of C++, which makes it pretty hard to uh, yield, uh, to, to use effectively. Um, and because of that, like because it's hard to read, hard to maintain, it, it also tends to be a bit costly, right? Because now if you have a large code base with a bunch of template metaprogramming in it, you, you have to hire people that can maintain it. And those, those people are generally not coming out of college with, with programming degrees. So you, the cost of maintenance goes up with template metaprogramming heavy code bases. The other downside of, of template metaprogramming is, is compile times. And if you've ever used a library that is heavily metaprogrammed, uh, like say Boost Spirit, um, 
one minute, two minute compilations are not not out of the ordinary for, for single files. Um, so the reason the reason we actually have these really slow compile times for template metaprogramming is that every intermediate result is codified as a template specialization, right? Like the basis of metaprogramming is class templates. So every function for which you provide arguments, every instantiation of those things becomes a new class in your in your program. And those classes never go away. They are part of the permanent record of the, the translation unit. You can't get rid of them. Um, so every time you instantiate a class, it sticks around. What happens, you basically just keep building up and building up and building up and building up all these intermediate computations, and you end up uh, you know, putting memory pressure on your system. Eventually, you'll get to a point, if you don't have enough RAM, you'll get to a point where your computer starts thrashing, and you might not ever actually finish compiling your program. Compilers have gotten better at this, but still, there's there are hard limits on what you can actually do with template metaprogramming because of this, this aspect. Right. I should also point out that um, because we use class templates for template metaprogramming, we've effectively picked the single largest data structure in the abstract syntax tree. Um, the, the footprint and memory of a, uh, of a class tends to be larger in every compiler that I've looked at than any other data structure in the abstract syntax tree, just because it has you know, a list of members, list of fields, which tends to be, can be kind of separate. You have to generate a bunch of default member functions, special member functions. There's a whole bunch of stuff that lives around classes that, that kind of add to that footprint and memory that you have to deal with every single time you instantiate a class. So at the end of the day, we just end up blowing up the amount of memory that you end up using for, for these kinds of computations. So we, we can actually do better. I, I claim that we can do better in some respects, right? Especially for computing values at compile time, because it turns out we already have really good tools for computing values. They're, they're called expressions. Like there's an app for that. And it also turns out that inside of compilers, these the results of expressions, the values that they compute, they're, they're ephemeral. They're small data structures, relatively small data structures. Um, like I think in, oh, I was going to say I know what the size of a, a value is in Clang, but I've forgotten. Um, but it tends not to be as large of a class. It's like in the order of 128 or 164 bytes versus versus 1K or 2K, something like that. It's a significant difference. And once you've computed the value and no longer need it, those things can just evaporate. So computing expressions at compile times, they don't incrementally build up the working set of your, of your compiler, right? So if we, if we want to get away from template metaprogramming, um, we really need to invest more time in what we can actually compute, what values we can compute at compile time. In C++ 98, 2003, we were, we were fairly limited, like array bounds, uh, template arguments, there wasn't much we could do with that. Right? Um, and those things were limited, like they couldn't call functions. Um, it, it was just a small set of expressions that you could use to evaluate um, evaluate these in, in these contexts. Right? So around 2005, 2006, I think, um, uh, Gabriel Dos Reyes introduced a, had a proposal for C++ called Generalized Constant Expressions where he took the, the kind of constant folding functionality that C++ was using for, for those various contexts, like array bounds, case, uh, switch statement cases, stuff like that, and uh, proposed that we allow effectively that you can be able to call functions, a small subset of functions with, with very limited definitions. Right? So you, could, you can write a, an array bound that calls some function like nth prime, give it the fourth value, and you come back with like the fourth prime number in a, in a sequence. Um, and again, you can write it in somewhat normal code. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the results are ephemeral. They, they, they evaporate, so we don't have this blow up of memory. Um, and most importantly, it actually guaranteed that the, the values were actually computed at compile time. It wasn't like try to force the compiler to, or to compute something at compile time and hope the inliner picks it up. It's a guarantee that these things will be computed at compile time. Okay. So here's a, a small function factorial that is a it is a meta program, right? It, it happens at compile time. So we declare const expert factorial. This is a C11 version. It's fairly straightforward. Um, just recursively compute the value. This is the original way that we wrote const expert functions, const expert meta programs in, in C11. We were limited to functions that could return, uh, that, that had a single line of code. There was no local variables. Um, couldn't really do other th anything other than return it. So this is effectively what we got. It's it's better, but not necessarily, excuse me, not necessarily ideal. 
right? So if you actually compile this thing down, I, I ran through Compiler Explorer to get this, you can actually see, like, this is the body of main, right? I, I see how I compute the variable effect n stores factorial 5, and then see how n, and, oh, that's right, I forgot. This is not actually the body of main. I changed the function <laughs> before I compiled this. The previous version was actually returning, uh, returning the val computed value. So this just returns the computed value 120, and this is the entirety. This was the entirety of the program. There's nothing else in it. It just computes the value, and you immediately return it from your uh, from main, for example. Okay. So the generalization of constant expressions, like the initial version of constexpr, uh, we move from a limited Turing complete functional programming language based on templates to a limited Turing complete functional programming functional programming language based on basically normal C++, right? Functions look like functions. They just have the const expert keyword. Uh, function calls are function calls, return statements, are return, they, they return values. So everything is basically, you know, normal, normal programming at this point. If you're computing values at compile time, this is an order of magnitude improvement over, over template metaprogramming, right? There are some issues with this, of course, right? Like, this const expert doesn't necessarily mean it does happen at compile time. It means it can be used at compile time. That's not really like a serious design problem or anything like that. It's just it's just something that you actually have to keep in mind as you write const expert code. Like it again, it does not mean that it will happen at compile time, just that it can happen at compile time. And again, we are limited to a, a, a range of expressions and just one-line functions in, in C, right? So we're not we're not able to use the entirety of the language for, for compile time computation. Again, a limited Turing complete uh, functional programming language, essentially. So in C++, or sorry, in, C, in I think, uh, 13, I'm going to go with 2013, nah, 2012. Uh, Richard Smith wrote a proposal for C++ to relax, relax these constraints and start allowing us to use uh, local variables for constant expert functions. So by the time C++14 shipped, we could actually write this. This is a normal iterative computation of factorial. This also turns out to have better compile time performance than the recursive one, because modifying local state turns out to be a lot less expensive than building up stack frames of compile time and tearing them down when you return values. So we get better expressiveness, we get faster compile times. This, this turns out to be a big win for context for programming, right? And in C20, we keep like we keep relaxing these rules. We can we can use more and more C and const expert. If you really wanted to write factorial uh, this way, where you dynamically allocate the counter, um, you could. I would not recommend this unless you are really a fan of dynamically allocating locals and deleting them. Um, by the way, I tried to make this work with make unique, but it's not like the library isn't uh, in uh, available for const expert quite yet. But I believe you could rewrite this using make unique for C20. I think. Don't take my word for it, but I think that you could do that. So by C20, now we have a Turing complete imperative programming language language for metaprogramming, right? Right. So it looks like regular C++, it feels like regular C++. We can have we can use most C++ control flow statements. I think that includes switch statements. I'm like 95% sure it includes switch statements. Um, and again, if you are using this for computing values at compile time, fantastic. This is actually two orders of magnitude better. Because we can actually take this, like the language that we have now, we can actually use to const expert almost the entirety of the C++ standard library's algorithms. I'm not sure if we do that, but I believe it's possible to do, which is which is really quite impressive. All right. And again, const expert metaprogramming, like, where this really shines, if you have static data to compile, um, or if you have static data feeding into your program and you can offload that to the compiler, this is one thing that you can do to reduce startup costs. You can, instead of deferring to runtime, you can have your compiler compute fairly complex data um, if you can do it and uh, kind of instantiate that back out as, as data that you can use in your program without having to compute it ahead of time. There are some other, other, some other benefits, uh, primarily compared to template metaprogramming for computing values, um, dramatically improved compile times. We don't have to keep all this this sort of memory blow up floating around these all these extra classes in our in memory. Um, and in some cases, there is an improved expression of intent. Like sometimes you can write clearer code using const expert than you could with with named constants uh, named constants. For example, if the, the 
constant doesn't really have a great name, but you can write it in sort of a, a computed form that makes more sense. I've seen that used really effectively in um, in case labels, for example, where the the case the actual labels are derived from some uh, like like some concept or function applied to a character literal. It's really, some really interesting cases, like automatically hashing the character literal and generating the case label from that. That is pretty slick use, actually. All right. Um, so there are some downsides, of course, to const expert. Uh, like it, we can only work with values. So the idea of computing programs involving types automatically disappears. Uh, it doesn't exist. Can't do it. Uh, again, it's only values. And even though we've expanded the capabilities of const expert a lot, um, we're still limited in some ways, right? Like we can't throw exceptions. Your program is ill-formed if you actually throw an exception. Um, you can't use go to. I know that's. Uh, seriously affecting the way that I write const expert code, which would be a, a heavy sarcasm in that case. Um, you can't reinterpret cast uh, values or objects or pointers in, in const expert code, which actually stung me yesterday when I was trying to write something, just a static const expert variable that was a reinterpreted cast and pointer. Unfortunate, but it's it's a limitation that we can live with and work around. Um, and again, there's, there is now like with, with const eval, which is a different flavor of const expert, we really end up in C++ 20 with this kind of trifurcation of the function space. We have functions that are runtime only, which have no const expert or const eval specifier. We have functions that could be runtime or can be used at compile time, which are const expert function. And we have this third flavor, which is const eval, which is like, if you call this function, it is guaranteed to happen more or less where you call it. It is guaranteed to be computed at compile time. And I actually, Took slides out that talked about that, but they that will show up later in the program in this this talk. And again, it's not really that bad. It's just it's not a downside of const expert. It's just something that you have to think about if you're designing a library for other people to use. Just another aspect of your design. All right. So compile time metaprogramming in general, like all we're doing is just computing values and types at compile time. That's that's really what it is. We're just taking advantage of compiler facilities to affect the program being compiled. Right. So for template metaprogramming. We rely on template instantiation to synthesize new declarations that we can then refer to. Um, constant expression, we're, we're creating values. And with C++20, in some cases, we can actually start computing objects. Um, type traits provide access to a compiler's view of the view of type traits. So we have, we have facilities provided by the compiler that we're, we're just exploiting to do things at compile time. And then the results of whatever meta programs are run just get incorporated back into that translation unit, like as if you had written the result by hand. Right? So here's a, a small constant expression which invokes a meta program. Uh, obviously, this is going to be true. You call factorial of 5 is equal to 120. It runs out, it computes factorial 5, brings back the value 120, evaluates that in the equality statement. You have the usual stuff. It's really not fundamentally different than if you'd actually just written static assert true. You generate a value, you use the value to modify, effectively modify the program in place. Same thing with, with type traits and, and meta programs that return types, right? So make signed as a type trait here. Uh, if we feed it unsigned int, we're gonna instantiate that template, it's gonna go away, it's gonna go figure out what the signed version of unsigned int is, which we all know it's signed int, brings that type back, substitutes it into the program, and it's just as if we'd written this. So again, you go away, you compute the type, and plug the result back into the program to affect what was just written. So is that it? Is that all there is to metaprogramming? Is, are we like, it's just a relatively simple computational device. Go get a value, go get a type, go get a template and put it back in the program to affect everything below that when you, as you, as you interpret the program, right? And is that all there is? Have we, have we actually solved metaprogramming? Um, and of course, if you say yes, that's great. Um, if, you're, if you're happy with the facilities we have now, then I can end my talk and we can, uh, you guys can go celebrate your post-work uh, post work day in the usual manner. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are, are fairly unhappy with where the capabilities are, so we, we have more work that we can do. We have more functionality we can provide. Right? So if there are any questions on content presented so far, now would be a good time to ask. Yes? No? No, so far we have no questions in the chat. Cool, then everybody understands 100% of what I've said and agrees with it. Excellent. Absolutely. So it turns out there are some things that we cannot do with template metaprogramming and context. Um, we can't inspect type definitions. 
I can ask if a type is trivially copyable or if it's polymorphic, but I can't look at its members. I can't ask what members it has. Um, I can't ask if a function is const expert. I really can't ask anything about functions, just its address. I can't ask if a variable is declared inline. I can't ask anything about namespaces. They, they tend to be um, I guess persona non grata for, for the purpose of metaprogramming. Um, we can't generate new declarations, statements, expressions. Like We can work with types and values, but what we can't do is work with anything that's actually not an entity, like a type is an entity and a value is an entity, but we can't do anything with expressions. We can just, in some context, compute values from them. And we definitely can't read and write files at compile time. Uh, that turns out to be a really interesting problem. Okay. So the inability to do these things or the ability to do these things, I should say, let me invert that, would open up the door to a whole bunch of different applications. We could simplify a lot of code that we could normally write. Right. So if we want to do these things, if we want to be able to have broader introspection of, of declarations and entities, um, if we want to be able to work with expressions or namespaces or you know, non-types and non-values, um, we, we should be able to do that. Right? We'd, we'd like to be able to write programs or meta programs that, that really consume the program that you've written as input and generate more program as output, not just types and values. But if we want to do that, we're going to need a lot of new language features to support those goals. Okay. Um, and we can't we just want to start like throwing language features against a wall to see what sticks. It's nice to have some kind of guiding principles. And I, I have to admit that I kind of stole these from, from Bjarne Sturstrup's um, history of programming papers, history of programming languages paper, uh, because they were they were good design principles. Uh, specifically, some of these applied to, um, to to concepts, templates, and concepts, and, and not metaprogramming in general. But um, we we'd like the the language features to be general and expressive. Like I don't want to limit what what you guys what you you programmers can write. Um, based on what I can imagine. Like my, my imagination is somewhat limited in terms of metaprogramming, or at least it was, it's been, my eyes have been opened a little bit from seeing people's examples. But if I design a language for me, I'm not designing a language for, for everybody. It should be, I should design a language that allows you to write what you need to write, right? But at the same time, I don't want to create a new Turing complete subsystem for the language. We, we don't need, for example, to embed a Lisp interpreter into into C++ just to get to get macros to work, syntactic macros to work, or something like that. Um, and thankfully, we didn't. We avoided introducing one with concepts so far. Hopefully, nobody breaks that in the future. We we should avoid doing making another one with with metaprogramming. Besides, we already have two, right? We have templates and we have const expert. Um, having a third would be weird. So we, we shouldn't necessarily, uh, so we, we want to build on existing features. We want the we want features that we are producing to be sort of vertically layered. Um, we don't want to create entirely independent features. Like here's a feature for reflecting or inspecting source code and here's a feature for injecting it. If they're not related in some way, then we end up with these, they might be orthogonal, but they end up being two new major new subsystems that you need to learn. And if they have no interaction between them, that makes it kind of, it might make it kind of weird. Um, and ideally, of course, we'd like to avoid repetitive programming. So if, if there are common metaprogramming patterns, we should find, uh, find what those idioms are and try to encapsulate them in a way that makes them non-repetitive and, and non-error prone. Error prone. Um, and that is definitely not something that I'm talking about today. Um, and of course, like at, the, at the end of the day, we don't want to slow the compiler down more than it needs to be. Um, unfortunately, the more metaprogramming you enable, the more metaprogramming you're going to get in your, your translation units and your compile times will slow down, right? So we wanna be able to make sure that whatever features we propose, compilers can implement them, them in a way that doesn't turn your existing 24 hour build into a 48 hour build. That would, that would probably be a non-starter for, uh, for, for, for any of these features. All right. So there's, there's three core features that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, static reflection, which is really the compile time inspection of declarations, types, expressions. Um, if you can write it, you can inspect it, essentially, is the, the kind of core idea behind static reflection. Uh, source code injection is uh, sort of a supplemental aspect of that. Like it, it provides the capability to create new parts of programs and inject them into, into a, 
into source code. So we could actually do things like creating member variables or creating expressions on the fly and then injecting those back into your program. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about compile time file IO, which is completely new and nobody, almost nobody has seen before um, because this just kind of came together within the last month as an idea uh, based on some discussions internally here at, at, at Lock3. Okay, so all the features I'm talking about today, well, the, sorry, um, static reflection and source code injection are based on two existing proposals for C++, um, P1240 and P1717. Uh, P1240 was a collaborative effort with Faisal Valley and uh, David Vandervoort, um, which was just static reflection. P1717 was um, Wyatt Childers and I, my work, um, which actually stemmed from previous work uh, with Herb, uh, Herb Sutter on, on meta classes. Basically, we designed the, the, the core functionality to make meta classes work, and that, that became P17, uh, P1717. Um, there is a compiler that implements the syntax in P1717. Unfortunately, I decided when I, when I uh, embarked on this, my latest work that I didn't like any of that syntax or some of the syntax for P1240 and, and changed it all. So none of the examples in this talk can be compiled anywhere Although you can probably map them back to the compiler uh, linked to in, in, uh, on this slide. Uh, and by the way, this is a, a Clang-based uh, implementation. There are comprehensive build instructions, so if you want to go grab it and play around with it, you can. I should have posted this, but it's also on um, Compiler Explorer on uh, cppx.compilerexplorer.org. Uh, sorry, cppx.godbold.com, I think, .org. I forget. Okay. So... Static reflection. Uh, this is really the one of the major low-level pillars of metaprogramming. And again, it supports the inspection of declarations, types, and expressions. The idea is that really we have two major use cases here. Um, we should be able to traverse or navigate a program structure. So if, if I can reflect a class, I should be able to look at the members of the class. If I have a member of the class, I should be able to ask what its type is. And from that type, I should be able to get its definition and look at its members and so forth and so forth and so forth, right? Um, and then, of course, once I have a reflection of a, a class or um, uh, like an enum or something like that, I should be able to ask for its syntactic and, and semantic properties, meaning I can ask where it lives in the source code, for example, or um, like whether the type is signed, uh, whether it's what, what its size is, what its alignment is, whether it's polymorphic, so forth and so on, things like that. Um, and then, of course, what's also included in static reflection is the ability to take to generate references to those those entities. So, if I have a reflection or a handle to a namespace, I can insert that reference back into my program as if as if I'd written it by hand. So, yes. So this really answers like re static reflection immediately answers this question. Like, if I want to get the name of an enumerator, how do I do that? Um, and I know this sometimes this is kind of like mocked as a weird, like a bad example, but I, I think this example pops up for me at least once a, once a month, every now and then I'm like, I would like to print the name of this enumerator. Uh, and how do I do that? And then I look online and I find a bunch of uh, preprocessor based solutions. And I think I don't want to make my code worse. I guess I'll just write something on my own. So I, like, there are ways to do it, but it requires some external work, some, some help. Okay. So, Using static reflection, we can do this relatively easily. And instead of presenting, like incrementally introducing all the features that I'm going to use, I'm just going to uh, turn on a fire hose and let you guys have the full implementation, which is only three lines, right? So this is going to be very easy to understand, I hope. Um, all right, so this is the entirety of the implementation in, uh, for, for generating the name of an enumerator. Uh, there's, there's a lot here, unfortunately. So, the first thing, the first thing we do when we want to get the name of the enumerator is to reflect on the type. Right, so this is this is getting a reflection of of whatever the enumeration type T is. Um, the the reify keyword is is the reflection operator. We've been uh, collaborators, colleagues, the committee, and uh, others have been back up, back and forth on the name of of what how you should spell the reflection operator. Uh, it's called Reflexper in a lot of papers. I've I've tentatively renamed it to Reify just because of a a different understanding of what I have of the operator at this point. So if we Reify a type, we get 
a handle of that type that we can now use as a first class, uh, first class citizen of the language. Specifically, we get a value from it. So we reify the type, we get, we get this meta info object. So X is a, um, a meta info, a meta info object. And a meta info object is just, it's a handle to an internal compiler structure. If you guys have ever worked on a compiler before or uh, written one, for example, in, in, in college or just as a hobby, um, this is a point effectively, at least in Clang, it's a pointer to an abstract syntax tree. It's a, a pointer to a node in an abstract syntax tree. It's just that we've laundered it through the const expert uh, system to let a, a, a meta program use that as a, as a handle. So it's an opaque handle to the actual enum definition. And um, those meta objects, those meta info objects, they have to be const expert, right? If, if, it's, if it's a compile time value, if the handle is something the compiler has, um, we, we, it, if it's not compile time, then you run the risk of, of leaking that into the runtime system where the compiler doesn't exist, right? Like the abstract syntax tree does not live at, at runtime. We have an embedded data into your executable. So if you manage to leak these things to, to runtime, your, your program could do something very unexpected, like crashing immediately. Okay, so we get a, a compile time handle to the, the type of the, um, the, the, the actual enum definition. And then we use a, this new kind of for loop which was actually proposed for C++20. Uh, it was approved by the evolution working group. Uh, and then unfortunately the clock ran out and uh, it didn't quite make it into C++20. So uh, a template for loop is kind of like a range based for loop, except instead of iterating through members of a range, it takes the body of the loop. So in this case, uh, this stuff here, and basically it instantiates one body of the loop for every element of the range, if that makes sense. So we are spamming out three different versions of, of this if statement, essentially. Right? Well, not three different versions. We're spamming out one version of this if statement for every member of the enumeration. So if your enum has the enumerators uh, A, B, and C, we would get three if statements of uh, corresponding to the members of that thing. Um, and again, so the range here is the meta members of that tells you, well, that gives you a range of reflections of enumerators. So each E becomes a reflection of A, then it becomes a reflection of B, and then it becomes a reflection of C, if that makes sense. So in each body of this loop, E is initially a reflection of A, then E is a reflection of B, and then E is a reflection of C. And because those are reflections, again, they have to be, they have to be const expert. They cannot leak to runtime. Okay, so erasing on the slide. So the if statement, uh, the body of the loop is actually fairly simple, except for this little guy here. This is called a splice operator. The, the splice operator takes a reflection and generates or inserts into your program a reference to the thing that you're reflecting. So if E was the enumerators A, B, and C. I apologize for writing like a child. I'm not good with my index finger. Um, so if e, if e is the enumerator A, then B, then C, the splice of those reflections is going to generate the value of A, the value of B, and the value of C. So what happens is that we have, basically we're generating a bunch of if statements. Is the value equal to A? If so, then return the name of that expression. Is the value equal to B? If so, then return the name of that, that enumerator. Is the value equal to C? If so, then return its name. So we're basically spanning out a bunch of if statements that test individually what the value of, uh, what enumerator val actually is, and then extracting them through this metaprogramming library. And that is the entirety of computing the value, the name or the uh, printable version of a name in, um, uh, in, with, with static reflection. Okay. Uh, this later on. So I have a bunch of slides that basically just reiterate what I just said. I'm going to go through these really quickly. Uh, mostly these are here for when I publish the slides after the talk and you can go and look at them and, and have um, something to refer to that isn't me talking. So the reify operator again returns a reflection of its operand. We can reflect expressions, you can reflect type names, you can reflect namespace names. Essentially if you can write the name of something you can get a handle to it. And again the meta info object, the thing that you get back from reflection is this opaque handle to an internal compiler structure, AST node, something like that. 
that, that can then be queried for its properties for traversal and whatever. Um, there is a very, very large library of functions that support this. So think, think about the type traits that the C++ standard library defines, and then imagine any question you might possibly want to ask about any entity that you can write or any declaration you can write in C++, and we've got a function that gives you that thing, for the most part. Um, there is one big subset of functionality that we don't do, we don't have in place, which is being able to actually walk through an expression and, and fully decompose an expression to its, its parts. That's that's a, an application in dire need of uh, motivating use cases at the moment. And almost all of these are just implemented with compiler intrinsics. They're just magic functions. So we've basically taken the, the little window that type traits gives you into the, the compiler's view of types and, and blown that wide open. So you have a gigantic window, a giant, a giant pane glass window into the compiler's view of whatever you've written into the program. Um, splicing, again, takes a, a constant reflection, so it has to be a constant expression, uh, x, and it forms a reference to the reflected entity. And we have kind of these interesting splicing rules or splicing equation that if you, if you splice, a or splice a reflection, you get back exactly what you wrote. So if you reify the expression 3 plus 4 and then splice that back in a program, you get exactly 3 plus 4 or, or something equivalent to that, if that makes any sense. Okay, and again, this is a very high level and topical description of, of what static reflection does. I, I recommend reading P1240 and adapting it to the syntax um, or, or watching the talks that I referenced earlier on uh, from CPPCon last year. Okay, uh, another quick example. Um, uh, I, this has kind of come up a lot in, in, in the past. I think it's, it's easier to answer this question once we've had um, the uh, spaceship operator, or now that we have the spaceship operator in C++20. But this, this question that we're asking, how do I compare like, members of A and B, like a pairwise equality of, of A and two objects of the same type, this is a very general question. Um, you can very easily turn this into, how do I hash members of a type? How do I serialize members of a type? They are effectively the same kinds of questions. And again, rather than introducing ideas incrementally, here's the entirety of that algorithm. And it, it works almost exactly the same way as before. Right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to grab a reflection of the type T. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a class. Um, well, it, I, this concept says it's regular, but it, it needs to be a class type. Um, so that should say something else in that case. Um, you grab a reflection of its type. We write an expansion statement over the just the data members of, of that class. So we're only looking at you know member variables and not not member functions or static member functions. We we just want the the, the things that would contribute to the value of a class rather than its static properties. Um, and then we can just splice in splice in references to each member variable because we've we already have a reflection of them. So we can write a dot the splice of the member variable, b dot splice of the member variable, and we can just compare those directly using uh, operator equal and operator not equal. Uh, assuming of course that the that operator is defined for those data members. Um, so hopefully that's the case. And this is the entirety of, of comparing, lexicographically comparing two objects of the same type for equality. This is this kind of structural decomposition or structural algorithm uh, is, is a very common pattern. You can probably really easily how you imagine how you might write uh, hashing or, or serialization algorithms using this for, for at least for simple classes. So are there any, any questions about, about static reflection at this point? I, I know that's a lot to, to consume and uh, a very, very high level presentation of those features. But uh, if there are any, any obvious questions I can answer, I will do so now. Okay, so we had some questions on uh, slide 39. 39. Starting with a bit of a generic uh, question, uh, which is, what about Circle? So the, the Circle language, uh, it reuses C++ standard runtime syntax for compile time. So there is yes. no no more two different languages for runtime and compile and, and template language. Well, so it's it's true that it reuses C++ kind of the same way that Const Expert does. It just has no restrictions on what what subset of C++ that you can use. Um, but it, it does, the, at least the last time I looked at it, the way that it addresses reflection is to sort of introduce a new set of 
a new set of constructs on top of the language to support that. So if you want to ask for the members of um, like the members of a class, you you write, if I'm going to remember this correctly, at members, and that gives you back, I, I think, a type list. I, I could be completely wrong, so please uh, don't take this for any kind of um, uh, authoritative evaluation of that language. But y you do have these sort of intrinsics um, built on top of the language that return return something that you can then use in within within a metaprogramming system. So while it's true that you do get the entirety of C++ for computing values in compile time, there's a there's a tertiary system or secondary system on top of that for reflection and um, and uh, source code injection. And I don't know all the details of how Circle works, so please uh, excuse that, that lack of knowledge. Okay. Um, still on the same slide, um, why do we need a new splice operator? Uh, could we not just have a function, meta value of? So, yes and no. Um, if you want to function, was it, we actually talked about using just standard get. Um, the, you, you can write it, but you have to explicitly specify the type of the thing that you want on the way out. So you'd have to write standard get uh, angle brackets t of a value. And then there's a question of, um, you know, what happens if you get the type wrong? Well, that's probably a compiler error. But it turns out that in the implementation of standard get, you're still going to have to have some kind of either compiler intrinsic or magical operator that takes, uh, that, that actually just gives you back the value and then converts it to the, the, the respective type. So we just went ahead and exposed the splice operator as, as a real operator, rather than trying to force somebody, trying to force you guys to write a function that would be longer to write and in some ways less capable, right? Like you could not use that same function to splice in the name of a type or the name of a namespace or a complete expression. Like I have an example later in this talk where I splice in an initializer, which is not at all something that you can use a function for. So this is a much more com much more uh, featured uh, operator than, than a normal function. Okay. Right, like if it were a function, I don't think, uh, I don't think this would work. Where is erase? Like, I, I don't think this would work if it was a normal function. I mean, you, you could return a member function pointer or a member pointer and then write dot star, but that's, you know, that doesn't exactly make the program easier to read. Yeah, exactly. And it wouldn't work at all Probably for Probably more, more ugly. And it would not work at all for bit fields because you can't take the address of a bit field. But this will work with bit fields. Okay. Cool. Um, then, is the meta namespace something that needs to be included? Uh, is any part of this uh, envisioned? Uh, is, it, is this an envisioned part for the SDL, or is it all in, in the language? Yeah, so our implementation right now puts this in standard experimental. So it's really, this is just an alias for standard experimental meta, or standard colon colon experimental colon colon meta. Um, I, I would hope that as this moves forward in the committee that it would just be standard colon colon meta. That would that would be my my ideal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I think that's all the questions that we currently have. Okay. So the next pillar of source code injection, but it's not technically a pillar because it builds directly on top of reflection. But the the, the next major feature is source code injection. Um, so rather than working with pro parts of a program that have already been written, the, the goal here is to support the ability to create new parts of the program, create new parts of a program programmatically, uh, and then inject them into the, the source code. And so the mechanism that, that we have to do this are called source code fragments, and then uh, a set of operators that lets you um, inject those into the program. So it's kind of like splicing, but it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, by the way, source code fragments in other languages, um, if, you, if anybody's familiar with like template Haskell, uh, and I, maybe Julia, I think are called quotes. So we are quoting a piece of code that we are then going to splice or inject into the program later. Later, right? So the, like the question that I want from, from this is, you know, if we have a tuple, uh, the way that we implement this today is to use some kind of recursive inheritance from meta, like this weird, weird little meta programming framework that will sort of spam out args 
this this pack of arguments into into base classes, uh, which is fairly complex and uh, can be uh, hard for your compiler to work with. It definitely makes it slow. If we could just generate a sequence of members, you know, uh, like X, Y, and Z, that would be a lot less overhead for the compiler if, if we could do that, right? So I'm just gonna show you the example of, of how I'm gonna, what that looks like. Although I'm gonna change the order in which I'm presenting this a little bit now that I think about it. So if I wrote something like this, you know, a tuple of int care bool, what I would like for my specialization when I instantiate that class to be is effectively this just to generate each one of these members. And then of course the constructors and accessors that return those things, which I am not going to show you because that would be like, that's probably a talk in and of itself. So the way that we do that is through what is, the, what I have essentially just call a meta program, which is, which is this thing here, this const eval block. So inside of the class uh, tuple, we actually have, we, we literally have a meta program. This thing uh, starts here, ends here. Um, this is executed effectively as the compiler sees it. It's kind of the way that I think about how these works, these work. And the, the, briefly, the, the way this meta program works is to iterate over all the arguments, reflections of the, the whatever types that you've provided, um, to generate a, a, a fragment that contains uh, a member variable declaration, and then to insert that fragment back into the class in which the meta program executes, which Sounds like a lot, and in fact, it actually is fairly difficult to, to, to make work. Basically, that meta program does exactly this. All right. So this conceive of block, uh, we start off just to declare n as a normal counter. Uh, we're going to use that to number remember, member, number member variables, and then we, we just have a for loop that iterates over the um, the reflections of all of these arguments. Right. So args is a pack. We can we can reflect on a pack. Uh, and we can expand that thing. So this generates an initializer list of reflections of each arg, each uh, each argument that's been, been provided. Oh, and I, I should I, I forgot to add. I need to point this out. Um, these meta programs they only they only execute when you instantiate the template. It doesn't happen uh, as you parse the template. All right. So each of these arguments is going to combine uh, conform to uh, int, Karen bool. We're going to have T binding to a reflection to each one of those uh, those types in order here. Um, now this does not need to be a uh, this this is just a regular for loop. It's not an expansion statement. Um, we're already executing at compile time. This is already a, it's already a meta program, so we don't need to we don't need to expand this thing. We don't need to guarantee that anything else is in fact compile time in, in this case. All right. So the um, the body of this loop uh, creates a new a new reflection of this kind of weird looking thing here in the angle brackets, this angle bracket class thing. This is called a class fragment. It is a part of a class. Um, basically, inside of a class fragment, we can write anything that we would want to eventually put into a class. And in this case, I'm going to input a, uh, a member variable declaration, which is the next line. So this is kind of hard to read, but I'm going to break it apart so you guys can see it. This is the type of the member variable, type name, splice was this weird percent thing. And this generates the name of the member variable. Okay. So the type of the member variable, because T is going to be a reflection of a type, we're just splicing the type into the program, sort of. Unfortunately, because we're inside of a fragment and T is a local variable, this kind of becomes sort of like Lambda-like. So we actually have to have a mechanism of saying, within this fragment, we're going to refer to a local variable. That's what this percent, uh, what this percent operator here does. That's basically, a, a we call it the unquote operator or a fragment interpolation. We're taking the current value of T in the, the local, local context, and we're inserting that into the, the fragment. It's a, effectively a placeholder for a value that's going to be supplied later on. So generally, we're just splicing the, the type is formed from splicing the type into the, the into the fragment. The name uses a very a kind of a different kind of splice. This is actually called an identifier splice. The the vertical bar hash uh, vertical bar these these tokens here. Um, where so whereas a normal splice gives you a reference to an entity that you've previously reflected. 
um, the identifier splice actually generates a new identifier for you. You're not referring to anything. You're actually creating a new identifier that's then subject to lookup or, or declaration rules. And it turns out that we actually have to do this. There's, there's no way that we can generate identifiers with using the same splice idea, uh, the same splicing operator as, as uh, just generating references in general. Like we have to create this new thing. They are fundamentally two different operators. And so this identifier splice operator isn't particularly complicated. It just takes a string, uh, in this case, literally a standard string at compile time, or a string view, or a C string, or something that can be converted into a string, and generates a new identifier of that name. In this case, mem underscore plus. And again, we have to splice in the value of our count. So the first time through this loop, we'd be splicing uh, mem0, or generating the name mem0, second time mem1, second, third time mem2, and so forth and so, and so on. So this, this one fragment that we generate here, this entire thing generates each of the member variables that you find uh, in the, the final product. Sorry. It, it describes the member variables that you find in the final project. This statement here, the arrow uh, fragment, this is called an injection statement. It takes, uh, it takes a, a fragment, an injection statement, it takes a fragment, and it causes it to be injected into the program at a particular point. And especially what happens is that we, we kind of queue these things up. So as we run this loop, we queue up all of these injections and we apply them at this point of the program here when the metaprogram is finished running, right? So the loop walkthrough, generate the member, for, uh, generate a member variable uh, mem0, generate a member variable mem1, generate mem2, queue all those up, the metaprogram finishes executing, and all of those are then inserted into the program as if you'd written them by hand. They, they literally generate this code. And the reason those end up getting queued up like that is because of the results of some early experimentation around 2016 or 17, um, where we were applying the result immediately. Like, as soon as you inject this thing, just go modify the source code. Uh, except that it turns out that if you have a loop that iterates over a class and you're injecting into the same class, um, your loop never terminates, which turns out to be an unfortunate, an unfortunate thing to have happen. So we have this kind of buffered system where side effects are applied at the end of a metaprogram, uh, metaprogram evaluation rather than, rather than immediately. Okay. And so this, this metaprogram will in fact generate this code for, for tuple. And you can kind of imagine using similar techniques to generate constructors, although they are much, much harder to write because of function parameters. And then also get functions, uh, specializations of standard get, and so forth and so on. So again, briefly, you have a set of slides that describe these things. Uh, so a metaprogram uh, is basically a const eval block. can appear namespace scope, class scope, block scope. Um, it's basically code that gets executed where it appears in the, in the program. Um, it defines something called an injection context, meaning that if you execute a const expert function or, or a const eval function that invokes the, um, the, the that uses a, an injection statement, uh, that injection statement is applied at the end of the where the meta program executes. So as the as the example shows here. By the way, this is a, a namespace, <clears throat> excuse me, a namespace fragment that's injecting a global variable. Not particularly interesting. Uh, source code fragments, they are just parts of namespaces, class, EMs, blocks, parts of a new initializer list. Um, they're just they're weirdly they're expressions. They they're they're not declarations. Um, but it works out, it, it turned out to work out better if uh, if a fragment actually produced a value that you could work with, rather than it being a declaration that you could name. Um, it also avoids a lot of weird questions like, can you make these things templates? And the answer is, I don't want to think about that, so let's not. Um, but they, they generally act as kind of like a container, these fragments, containers of member statements or expressions. They're not, like a class fragment is not a class. It's just a container of things that will eventually go into a class. Um, they can only be injected into like context, so a class fragment can only be injected into a class body. A uh, block fragment can only be injected into a function body or another another blocks or another statement, for example. Um, so, and again, some languages do call these quotes. Um, we ended up with fragments because they're, uh, I don't know, they, we just started that way. Um, interpolated values, the, the sort of unquote operator, like if, if a fragment is a quote, this is an unquote. Um, they're, they can be used to refer to local values within within the fragment. 
Um, this is because fragments, like I said, are, they're very, very lambda-like. Um, and so interpolated values are really stored as part of like the, the closure of the, the fragment. Um, essentially what happens is that during, during evaluation, we, we build up a more complete value and then when you inject it, all that information gets kind of thrown into a blender and, and generated into source code as you, uh, as you, as you, as you inject it. Um, injection statements, they accept a fragment and inject it. Um, again, injections are only observable after the metaprogram runs, not during, because you don't want infinitely looping, <laughs> infinitely looping metaprograms. Um, the actual mechanism for injecting source code is very, very much like template instantiation. Uh, we take something that is, for example, class-like, and we turn it into a class. It's a lot like what happens when you instantiate a class template. It's just that we have kind of different substitutions. Um, like we're substituting around the class rather than uh, template arguments, for example, like the injection context we substitute. And then we also substitute these um, unquoted or interpolated values so that we can actually, <coughs> excuse me, provide uh, essentially constant computed values into, or turn computed values back into source code later on. It's, it's a fairly complicated system, but it does work surprisingly well. So, um, I wanted to use this system to go back and revisit stringification just because I know that we can actually do better. And I, I wanted to give a, a non-tuple example of using uh, using source code fragments in, the, in an interesting way, right? Um, so if you remember the original version of this function is, is actually fairly linear. We are spamming out one if statement for every enumerator. And if you have a really large enumeration, a lot of values, uh, this, this gets kind of ungainly, right? It's a linear search through the number of enumerators defined in an enumeration. Uh, we, we should be able to do better, right? For example, what we could probably do is define a static static map of enumerator values to their names, uh, initialize that once when the function execute, first executes, and then make lookup constant time, right? That seems like a good strategy. Well, here's how you do that. Uh, in fact, we do exactly what I just said. You declare a map of enumerator values to the names, and make it static, so it's going to be initialized on first use. Uh, and then the, we initialize it with um, with this thing, which is kind of an interesting use of the splice operator. So this values of thing is basically going to take, uh, is going to construct a sequence of initializers, of, of pairs, uh, if you will, mapping from uh, the, the value of each T to uh, the name of the, the, its corresponding enumerator. Right. And this is what that function actually looks like. It's, it is it is a const eval function, right? I mentioned I was going to talk about these in a, in, later in the slide. Const eval functions are always executed where they appear in the program. So that, uh, values of appears here. We have to compute a vector of uh, a vector of, of reflections in this context. And that actually does happen at compile time um, as follows. So declare your result. Just a basic for loop because we're already in context for in, in com compile time evaluation land. We're already in a context where that this happens. We don't need to be uh, to expand anything. So again, iterate over the members of uh, of T. So we reflect, get a reflection of the enumerator or the enumeration. Um, iterate over each of its enumerators, get a, get a reflection to each one of those. Then we're going to generate a fragment, and that fragment is kind of I don't know if you can see it, but it's a, it's an expression fragment. So we have the, the angle bracket parens. And then inside of each expression, um, we actually have an initializer. So there's, there's a left brace for an initializer here, and there's a right brace for an initializer here. And the first member of that initializer is a splice of uh, the enumerator value, which we have to, which we have to interpolate, because again, we're inside of a fragment referring to a local variable. And the second value is a constant character pointer which we just use the name of. And again, we have to interpolate that um, because E again is a, is a local variable. So we're generating a list of fragments. Each fragment is a pair of a value of T and the name of T. Just push those into the back of the vector and return the result. And so what happens as you compile this, um, you get back a vector of reflections. If you splice a vector of reflections, uh, you get a pack, basically it generates a new, a new kind of like pack-like object that you can then expand using normal pack expansion syntax. So this will expand, splice in an expansion of each one of those enumerators 
into the initializer list of names. So at compile time, what this eventually compiles down to is names, left brace, and then a sequence of pairs of value name, value name, value name, as if you'd written it out by hand. And then we can just use the usual lookup trick for, for maps and call find and compare against end and uh, return the, the corresponding value as needed. So that is the, the constant time version of, of two string. Okay. So any questions? And I yes. imagine there will be some because this is complicated. <laughs> Sure. Yes, there are some questions. So we're going. Um, there was questions asked in slide forty-nine. Uh, which slide? Forty-nine. Forty-nine. Um, who will expand the template meta function at compile time? Who would expand a template meta function at compile time? Is that? Did I hear that right? Yeah. Um. Who would expand the template meta function compile time? Well, they, uh, uh, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, template meta functions, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there a better way to ask that? Um, I, I hope so. Um, if so, <laughs> then, then <laughs> I mean, uh, please, please ask it again. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I, I don't understand the question either. So. Yeah, I mean, meta functions are always evaluated at compile time, or at least wherever the instantiation is requested. Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to interpret the question. Well, yeah. let's come, let's come back to it. Yeah, and I mean, we're we're going to have an an after talk chat in Zoom. Right. Uh, we're going to post the link sometime soon, um, and that might be a better place to ask the question then. Sure. All right. Cool. So on slide fifty. Um, in the in the injection statement, uh, what tools do we have? For instance, can we use um, to lower for member names? Um, if I want to make my types uh, more readable uh, instead of mem underscore zero? Um, well, I mean, you can, so because we have an identifier splice operator, like the, the bar pound operator, you can name them whatever you want but if you're programmatically spamming out a bunch of names, they almost certainly have some some pattern. You know, mem underscore zero, mem underscore underscore one. Um, so it would be um, it's 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 hard to say. If if you wanted to if you wanted to label them or name them after their type, you you could do that because you can you can ask for the name of a type. So you can name it like int underscore bool underscore care underscore. So you can you can name them after their type. Although you run into issues if you have a tuple of like two ints, right? Because now you have a name collision, um, a declaration error essentially. Mm -hmm. So, if you know, my sense is that if you're programmatically generating names, it, that's not going to be part of your public interface. Like the actual names of data members in tuple are not part of its public interface. Their their accesses are spelled standard get zero, standard get one, standard get two, and I, I think that that would be preserved for for most meta programs. Um, right. That might not always be the case. I can imagine some tools where you have very specific names that you're generating, but um, in, in general, like for these cases, it's implementation detail, essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, we have a similar question uh, a bit later, um, which is what compile time string manipulation functions are foreseen? Oh, uh, compile time string manipulation is a great question. Uh, for, for C, I cannot answer Oh, do I foresee? Haha. <laughs> <laughs> foresee. Totally, totally different questions. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. in C plus twenty, uh, we we generally expect the full power of the standard. We a large subset of the full power of the standard library. So whatever, ideally, whatever we can do with strings at runtime, we should also be able to do at compile time. Now, I, I know that there like regular expressions are. Uh, a particularly interesting point of contention, and a lot of work has been done on compile time regular expressions. Like Hannah's, uh, Hannah's work on, on compile time regular expressions is really interesting. And uh, it would be great if we could eventually take those ideas and lift them so that we can actually potentially compute fairly complicated state machines um, for, for those things at compile time. Um, but I'm, I'm generally optimistic that Whatever you should be able to do at runtime, you should be able to do at compile time. That's okay. that's my 
optimistic view of that. Right. Um, except for some of the SSE optimizations with strings. I don't, I don't think anybody's going to write a compiler that emulates uh, the, the, the low level, you know, SSE style intrinsic optimizations for string analysis. That might be a bit, a bit, um, a bit much. Right. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of more questions. Um, let's, let's go for, for one or two more and then move on and, uh, continue in the after talk chat sure right so um is there a use case for uh storing a fragment in in meta info but then later not injecting it um sure uh <clears throat> yeah i mean i can imagine a meta program that synthesizes a bunch of synthesizes a bunch of fragments up front and then injects based on a filtered predicate um I mean, you can, although you can kind of rewrite that thing to just avoid generating those fragments to begin with. But yeah, there, there's no real limitations on what you can and cannot do with fragments. You don't have to inject them. They're just, it just ends up becoming a dead, sort of a dead value in your system. Mm -hmm. Although again, like because it's a const expert value, it doesn't stick around. If you don't use, a, if you don't actually inject a fragment, um, it's not like your your compiler is going to end up accumulating all these dead things that haven't been injected. They just go away after a while. Okay, cool. Good. And then uh, one one short question, um, hopefully, um, for these uh, for the class fragments. Can I use struct instead? Sure. Yep. Okay. You can use struct. You can name them. Uh, the visibility rules are the same for a class fragment. If you use class, it's private by default. Um, you can actually stick, we think that you should be able to stick base class specifiers after the class so that you can actually inject base classes. There's, yeah, there's a bunch of things that you can do with these things. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, as I said, there are a couple of more questions, um, but in, uh, in the, in the interest of, uh, of moving this along, I'd say we'll, we'll yes. move down to the after talk chat. I agree. Okay. Okay. So last, last thing I want to talk about is compile time file IO, which is uh, not directly related to either of the two topics, but it does make use of them at, at some point in a little bit, right? Um, in general, there's a bunch of use cases that we've gotten for the metaprogramming stuff of people that wanted to work with external data sources. Like maybe they want to um, generate their implementations of uh, like network reading and writing their data structures and rewrite algorithms directly from an external protocol, uh, protocol specification. I don't know, like protocol buffers. Um, or if you have a data definition to find an SQL database, I know at least one listener has some, some interest in metaprogramming and databases. <laughs> uh, you might be able to directly generate classes from, from, that, from that definition. Or by the way, the other way would be to generate uh, an, SQL data, an SQL definition directly from your implementation. So we, we can support both of those. Um, if you've written any .NET code or like Qt code recently, there's this notion of code behind where you have sort of a, a scripted or XML or database definition of your UI, and then there's some some magical hooks that, that bind your code to, to that data. Um, if we could import the data, those, those data files directly, we could maybe shape our code automatically to, to set, up those hooks, uh, set up those hooks for us and uh, synthesize data members that might need to be synthesized. Um, and then uh, ex embedding external data in binary seems to be a popular request for people that are working on embedded uh, embedded systems and um, and games, for example. Uh, and then, of course, like if we can read code, we should be able to write code. So, for example, if you have a fairly complex class hierarchy or sorry class library, you might be able to automatically generate bindings that can be compiled uh, separately and then integrated into uh, like Lua or or Python. And the idea of of most of these use cases is that we can reduce the number of external tools that need to be involved in our in our builds. If we can build synthesize our code from external specifications, we don't need a preprocessor to generate that code for us. If we can automatically spam out like binding code or SQL definitions, we don't need a preprocessor to scan scan our code files and generate that stuff for us either. Right. So unfortunately, like it seems like a really good idea, uh, but. Um, it turns out there are some serious issues with arbitrary, like with compile time IO, uh, that were kind of discovered during one of our last C++ standards committee meetings, uh, SG7. 
Um, and in particular, it, it should not be possible for a compiler to just sort of open arbitrary files at compile time. Like, I include your header file. Your header file has a meta program in it that goes out and opens my my SSH, my private SSH key. That doesn't sound like a great idea, right? There there are serious trust implications if your compiler has has carte blanche for your file system with whatever permissions it's running with. Right. One of the other issues was uh, a little bit more uh, sort of programming oriented, not trust oriented, was that if you can open arbitrary files and have the ability to do whatever string manipulations you want, there is absolutely no way to manage file dependencies. Um, and if you work in a system that has very large builds and very intricate file dependencies, you need those to be announced ahead of time so that your build can be parallelized correctly. If you can't announce your build dependencies or they're not discoverable by some external process or external uh, program, then parallelizing your build becomes uh, effectively impossible, right? So we need a more cautious approach to, to using external resources. We can't, we can't assume that our opening anything is a good idea. And I do have to give the caveat again, this is all new, like this is all work that, that we kind of developed in here at, at, uh, at lock three and we're just sort of sending this up the flagpole to see if it's uh, to get to get feedback for it. So the basic idea kind of follows the design of at least the the style of design of the um, the the meta programming static reflection stuff, which is that we provide a very low level facility for accessing files at compile time and then we can try to build higher level facilities on top of that. So the the initial idea is basically to say, well, like, you know, C plus plus twenty has this nice little module feature. A module is an external resource um, that the compiler doesn't know anything about, but the build system has to be able to support dependency tracking for. This is not fundamentally different than what you might want to do with resources. So in C plus plus twenty, at least, we should be able to import um, uh, resources just like they were modules. In fact, here's here's one of those right here. So this translation unit is importing a, a file, probably a file. Um, we don't really necessarily know what the name of the file is, but we know that logically its name is, the resource name is my.app.version. And it's responsible for some aspect of the build system to go and actually figure out what file that actually is. And whether or not, you know, and, and also by the way, to resolve the dependency between this translation unit, this source code file, and whatever the name of that file is that, that we're going to be importing. This is exactly how modules work, by the way. There aren't really any files called, for example, like standard.core. Uh, the, the compiler and, and some external tool conspire to figure out what, um, what files are implied by those names and whether or not, for example, you need to actually rebuild the module ahead of, uh, ahead of importing it. Right. So there, there's two parts of importing a resource. The first part is that you specify what the resource is, but you give it a name, right? So this imports a readable, a readable thing called my.app.version. Uh, readable, of course, meaning um, that, that you're going to use it for input. And the second part of this is a, a, a variable binding. Basically, we have to declare a variable uh, to, to hold that resource because module names turn out to be effectively useless outside of uh, import declarations. They don't. They don't have any meaning outside of the, the sort of prelude of a, of a of a translation unit in C You can't refer to them anywhere else in the source code, right? So this version of the translation unit, I should point out, like the meta resource thing is is effectively very POSIX like. If you guys are looking down here at the um, implementation of this thing, you would recognize uh, basically a POSIX function that reads from a file descriptor, explicitly null terminates a buffer, and then um, and then does something with it, right? This is an intentional design decision. Like this, we want this to be as low level as possible, specifically because uh, we don't want to overburden the compiler with too many abstractions for metaprogramming up front. If you, it's kind of turned out through some experimentation that the, the more abstraction that you use in, in metaprogramming, um, like the slower your compiler runs. And when I say abstraction, I don't mean things like virtual functions. I mean things like classes. Uh, it turns out that using classes is an abstraction penalty for, const for, for compile time programming, for context, for evaluation, for, for various reasons. It's, it's kind of a weird thing that happens. Like 
my, my motto is that for const expert, there is only abstraction penalty. So the lower level, like the lower, closer you are to the uh, sort of abstract metal in the sense, closer you are to the compiler's pure resources, the, the less likely you are to incur these penalties. Like resource is just a, basically a, an opaque handle to something. It's a scalar value. You can read from it, you can write from it to it, write from it, read to it, write to it. There's no, there's no classes, there's no pointers, there's no indirection. So it's as, as close to uh, easy evaluation as you can get. But other than that, it's explicitly uh, very POSIX-like. So this does something very simple. It reads in the version from a file, uh, converts it into an integer, and then automatically it turns around and injects a global version, uh, a global variable, uh, exports a const extra global variable called version, which again, in, interpolated here, just pulls in that version as the initializer, and everything is happy. Right? Now, of course, nobody wants to write this code. Like, like I didn't like writing this code, and I'm kind of embarrassed to show it, but I did want to point out the, the low level nature of these abstractions. Right? It would be better if we could go a little bit higher level. Like, why can't we have a, an ice stream to do this thing? Well, sure, we can allow that also. So here's the a, a same declaration. You import uh, the readable, readable uh, resource, uh, except instead of binding it to a resource uh, directly to a meta resource object, you bind it to a meta ice stream, which means because it's an ice stream, you get this fancy little uh, streaming interface that you can just extract the version and export exactly the same way you did before. Now, there, there isn't really anything magic about, about this class. It's just sort of the way that I imagine this working is that whatever the type of this variable is here, the compiler just kind of looks inside of it, and if it has a constructor that takes a meta resource, then we can initialize that thing. So basically, the, the meta ice stream is just an ice stream that, that is constructed directly over the meta resource. And then it can implement the usual ice stream interface, including overriding virtual functions, whatever, whatever, whatever. And because this is all compile time, uh, you know, virtual functions are fine. You don't have to think about it too much at, at, at runtime or, or at all in this case. Right. Now, Unfortunately, you still have to write the extraction of this, but we still have a meta program that's explicitly generating the thing. I think we should be able to do better. Uh, so why not just go ahead and directly import the resource as a standard string? This seems reasonable. And again, like talk about this thing here. So what I imagine is that if we look at this class and decide that you know if it can be constructed over a meta resource or if it can be constructed over a meta ice stream, as we do in this case, uh, then that can be used as a meta, meta variable also. And in fact, in this case, the basic string constructor just does exactly what we did before, just pulls in the, the contents of the string, and that's, that's the end of the day, end of the story. And now we can just have our, our export in one line uh, to inject a const expert global variable with a version calling string to i and, and synthesizing the resulting value in, in one shot. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the way that I expect one way that I think that we can work with with external resources or reading them and kind of parsing them into whatever constructs that we need for a program. One of the more interesting ways that we can think about doing that is to pull in structured data. So for example, if I have a configuration file that I want to I want to read at compile time, uh, maybe it's in JSON. So what I really want would like to do is to sort of take this this JSON document, parse it, and then have that directly correspond to an object or a, a structure, data structure, whose members are in fact the same as the names of objects that I would find in the, the JSON file. Basically building a one-to-one -one correspondence between the JSON object and the C++ object and their names, right? And so in that case, I can pull in something like this, which is a little bit interesting to, to describe how this works. But essentially, if that turns out to be, that thing turns out to be a template, that can be parameterized by, uh, say, a meta i stream or uh, a meta resource. Then we can move the const eval, the, the meta program, out of the program or out of the translation unit, and encapsulate that in that that, in this case, the document. So that document class will implicitly, when you instantiate this, will implicitly sort of spam out or or, or, or construct all the you know version dot major version dot minor based on. Um, whatever the contents of, of the ice stream are, actually are, or in, in this case, the JSON document. So we get, we get basically, we can synthesize this structure on the fly at compile time from the specification of the input file. 
or ideally generate compiler errors when somebody invariably misses a comma in the in the JSON document. So the last the last case is actually embedding data, and I know that there's a, been a set of um, uh, proposals for standard embed by uh, Jean Hyde, whose last name I'm not going to try to pronounce, um, and I, I apologize to Jean Hyde if he ever sees this. But the idea was that you should be able to take data and directly embed it into your program. I think there are tools for doing that with the, the linker today. You can just sort of splice some uh, some some external data into a program and have it link implicitly linked to a to a, a, a an extern static variable. Um, we should just be able to support that by default. I think the latest version of these proposals in the C++ has two parts to it. There's a preprocessor macro called hash depend or pound depend that enumerates the file, and there's a, the standard embed which can refer to that file that was that was previously depended on. This basically just pulls all that stuff together and reuses the module system to essentially do the same thing, except instead of a meta resource or an iStream, we pull it into a metadata object, which is uh, really not fundamentally different than a meta resource except that it will magically embed the contents of that file into the, uh, the, the binary of the translation unit. So this does have to be a meta, uh, a magic type. And then it effectively just exports the a span of bytes to cover that, that data. So you could imagine importing icons directly into an application by, by just referring them within, through the build system in this way. And, and of course, probably you can, uh, you, you're, because these are icons, you could probably have a user or an application specific class that called icon that makes them easier to work with rather than raw metadata, right? Okay, so that was it, it for meta, the compile time file IO. Uh, so to conclude, I guess, uh, metaprogramming really just isn't, isn't just about computing types and values at compile time, right? Like we, all of the, the really advanced things we want to do with metaprogram require the ability to inspect the entire, and I have a, a big question mark for the entire contents of the translation unit. Um, we have to be able to inspect more information about the source code that we've written. Get enumerators of an enum enumeration, inspect the members of a class, uh, parameters of a function, for example. We have to be able to work with all of these things. Um, we should be able to program with entities other, like non-types and non-values, expressions, um, namespaces. We have to be able to work, like program with scopes in, in a certain context to a certain extent. Uh, and then we, we really should be able to read and write external files. Um, this reduces the tooling burden for C++ significantly, hopefully. Um, and, and really, I guess my last thought is that the metaprogramming isn't really, again, it's not just about computing types and values in compile time. That's, that's part of it. Uh, really, you're, you're programming, by analogy, normally when you write programs, you are programming against an abstract machine that, that lifts away from you know, your, normal, your normal hardware, right? You have a CPU or FPU, GPUs, whatever. Well, in this case, metaprogramming, we've extended that to include the compiler itself. So your metaprogramming is not only your normal abstract machine or a subset of it, but an extension of that abstract machine that includes the source code that you've also written into your program. So you are actually programming your compiler. That is, that's what metaprogramming really is or, or could be. Um, so I guess that said, if there are any final questions, I will I'll answer those now. So we don't have any new questions, at least not in the chat. Um, but I've seen uh, seen some comments of people saying, "I want meta colon colon now." Um, so <laughs> Yay. I'm I'm sure you did that you uh, that you spiked some interest here. Um, oh. And um, for everybody who actually wants to ask questions or just wants to to chat about uh, potential applications of of what we just heard. Um, or just chat about whatever in C++. Um, there is the after talk chat. Um, the link has been posted to the uh, to this uh, Twitch chat. And um, well, we'll meet you there in a couple of minutes. Yep. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Um, thanks for for uh, everybody who listened. Um, and there are a couple of uh, thanks coming into the chat as well. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I will see you in a few minutes for the after uh, discussion. All right.